the bottom line to it and cut a very long story short, um, ended up going private, um, had loads of scans which were all working okay. And the last ultrasound scan I had, they actually found a lump on my kidney. Wow. So I had to go home and I felt so guilty to tell my other half that they found a lump on my kidney when she was going through all of this as well. And like my mind was just all over the shop and I went from kind of like thinking about Ironman Wales 11.45 to kind of like bloody hell, I might not be here kind of like at the end of the year. It, it was like, holy shit. Don't just talk it, walk it. Walk is on it. Don't just talk it, walk it. <laughs> Don't just I do this every week with you. We should be fine. <laughs> We're in the podcast mode. Don't just talk it, walk it. Walk is on it. Tom, how you doing, brother? Living the dream. Living the dream. I like that, <laughs> mate. I like that. Beautiful morning. Friday morning, uh, podcasting. I was good that I couldn't make a run with you this morning. Yeah. I really well, wanted to. You ran yesterday with us. That's the yeah. main thing. Yeah, hey, I found that hard yesterday. Yeah? Yeah, because I had two, week, well, two weeks off, essentially, because I was ill last week. Mm. It's 5K. And I'm finding it hard, like. Blowing. <laughs> You've done an Ironman before, haven't you? Yeah. Well, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Saying that, though, there is a bit of COVID getting around. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if I had a bit of COVID, to be honest. I'm not. I'm not saying you got you've had it, but it has like, like a lot of my mates recently, uh, the tastes are gone again. The yeah, smell. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think my, my, I I couldn't Sleeping. smell much for a couple of days, and uh, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if I had a bit of COVID. But <laughs> whatever, whatever. <laughs> well, mate, like obviously, I've been working with you for some time right now, and seeing your journey, which has been amazing. But I'm really intrigued about this episode today because I have. The minimal education in golf. So I'm sitting here right now like a sponge listening to it. All of my mates talk about golf. We're in the season right now where golf is thriving as well, yeah. well, as I can see it. People are turning me down to go play golf, like <laughs> I just told you. But even in the mornings in the gym, people are you know talking about golf. And I say, I'm getting Tom on. And they're like, wow, amazing. I'm from his area growing up. I know what he's like. I said, he's, he, they're like, he's rubbed shoulders with some of the biggest names in golf um, in the world, not just in, the, in that local area. So for me, man, it's, I'm very intrigued A, the, the crux of what you do and how you've be made this a business. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, like what I do right now, essentially I'm a PGA professional. Mm. I work out of Langland Bay Golf Club in Mumbles. Brilliant, brilliant club, brilliant yeah. place. Um, and the role really, kind of like to somebody who doesn't really know golf, is relatively complex because mm. there's lots of different kind of like facets to it, you know. Um, but the main part of the business really is club fitting because that's my background. That's what people come to me for. Um, but in the mix is kind of, you know, we've got like a retail space. So we sell clothes, golf balls, golf shoes, do a bit of coaching. Yeah. Um, I kind of uh, almost subcontract uh, or have subcontracted over the last couple of years to some um, some tours as well. Mm. So I don't know if you know about the Live Tour. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it um, that started a couple of years ago and uh, it's rattled the golf yeah, world. It, explain the Live Tour. Is that like kind of like a private kind of different aspect of it took away from the original concept of golf? Yeah, tournaments? so uh, essentially like the, the whole of golf really over the last however many years has revolved around the PGA Tour in America. Yeah and uh, the European tour. Mm. And two years ago, Liv came in and decided that they're gonna start their own tour and they're gonna start to buy some players and it literally fractured the whole golf industry and the whole golf world, you know, because all of a sudden then you had some really high profile players not playing in certain tournaments. Yeah. Um, and it, it was, uh, yeah, it was very interesting, but I got quite lucky because none of the brands, the big manufacturers, were allowed to go there because it was so controversial, mm. and they still needed people to service the players. So, luckily for me, that there's not really a huge amount of play, um, a huge amount of people about who have serviced some of the world's best players and not affiliated to a brand yeah. and available. <laughs> so it was kind of like really, really good for me over the last couple of years. I've done, I don't know, three or four events maybe. Um, so it's been, yeah, it's really good. Really, really good. So for me right now, so obviously I, knowing you, see, growing up you wanted to be a golfer, I'm assuming. No. No? No. Um, 
So I wanted to play number 10 for Wales. <laughs> <laughs> Fly off. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, uh, I'm not exaggerating. I didn't pick up a golf club until I was 14. Wow. And I was obsessed with rugby up until the age of 14. And um, all I wanted to do is play rugby. Mm. Um, like, any spare time, I'd be down the park, uh, you know, kicking a rugby ball over the swings, you yeah. know, and, you know, going through the routine like Neil Jenkins, you know. Mm. and Get the sand out. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I didn't discover golf really until I was 14. Um, but as soon as I discovered golf then, kind of like the rugby boots started to get used less yeah. and the golf club started to get used a lot <laughs> well, more, you know. Um, and because I started quite late, yeah. I never really had any ambitions to do anything in golf because, like, within... I guess a year and a half. I was finishing school, I'd done my GCSEs. Yeah. Um, and I still wasn't really that good at golf, so it wasn't really an option. So I actually started a, an apprenticeship, a mechanical engineering apprenticeship uh-huh. when I was 16. And um, still at that point, I kind of wasn't thinking about having a career in golf. But then I got better and better and better, and I was like, I want to do this. Yeah. So it's quite an interesting uh, situation, really, because my dad kind of got me the apprenticeship in the place he was working. And after like three years of a four-year apprenticeship, I've gone home with this wonderful idea. And I'm like, mum and dad, I'm going to give up my apprenticeship that I've just spent the last three years doing. um, And I'm going to become a professional golfer. (laughs) (laughs) But that went down well. Didn't go down well at all. Um, Like really, really didn't go down well at all. But I'd done it anyway. Mm. Um, And it's... uh, yeah, in, in a roundabout way, is kind of working out. So. Massively. Mm. Ah, well, we can talk bits and bobs about the business now. But So how did you even get into fitting, though, fitting clubs? And, you know, it's not like you're the first person, obviously I'm not in that industry and, and play golf, but like you're the first person I know. And then when I'm obviously getting to know you over the over some time now, you're like, wow, there's it's an, it's a very big art in this. And it's mm. if you are extremely good at it, you get rewarded extremely well as well. And... Um, you yeah, get, you, you get taken around do. the world from it. It's 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 not really like a um, like a lot of people don't get into golf mm. to do club fitting, mm. um, and I probably didn't either. You know, I just love being in a golf club. I love being in that environment. Um, but as kind of like my prog- uh, career progressed, I just became a bit more passionate about equipment, and mm. I just realised kind of how influential equipment can be to aid performance for golfers so like golfers most golfers want to improve yeah. um and a lot of them go for golf lessons and they don't really pay a huge amount of equip uh, attention to their equipment but it can have such a huge effect on what the golf ball does and it can happen instantly mm. so it's not like you need to go down the driving range and work on it for weeks and months like i could literally take someone's set of golf clubs and you know, make adjustments to them. Yeah. And I'm not saying it, it's going to revolutionise their performance, but it's definitely going to help, you help know. It. Um, Have you ever had, uh, like, obviously doing that on a lower level is good because you can communicate and there's no friction. But have you ever had that conversation with a, a pro and you, like, watched him on the course and you're like, listen, man, I've been watching you for some time right now and if I just tweak a few things here, you let me, get, you know, give me a blessing. I just want to see how this works for you and it's well help them. Yeah, yeah, I've done that a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's quite interesting because, like, the, there's such a difference with working, like, in the environment I'm working in now, which is with club golfers, um, you know, they're, they're essentially playing golf for fun. Um, when you're in an environment, really, where you're working in the biggest events in the world and you're working with the best players in the world, I mean, you make a little tweak to the equipment and you see that in the performance straight away. Mm-hmm. But the hardest thing is actually managing that situation because there's a huge amount of money on the line, mm. not just for the player, but for the coaches, for the caddies. Um, there's huge consequences to the recommendations and the uh, suggestions you're making. So you've got to be able to build a lot of trust. You've got to command some respect in that environment as well. And to a degree, you've got to have kind of like um, the right personality to stand there. And if you've got three people disagreeing with you, saying, I don't think this is right, you've got to be able to stand there and go, well, I know it's right. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> you know? Um And it's, uh, it's quite an interesting uh, dynamic where, like, with the best players, it's easier to change the ball flight through equipment, mm. um, but it's harder to manage their personality. And then with club golfers, who are perhaps less, uh, less skilled, you know, and I mean that in the most respectful of way, course. you know, compared to the, the best players in the world, 
sometimes you see uh, you don't see instant improvements from smaller changes. You've got to make bigger changes to see uh, improvements. But you don't need to manage their personality because they just want to get better. They've they've come to you to listen, you know, and um, the sponges essentially. Yeah, ex- exactly. So it's easier on one side of it and harder on the other side of it, you know. But um, I enjoy both. Yeah, this is amazing. That is, it's um, and and so many people I speak to regarding golf, it becomes like a drug in a nice way. I, I mean, like you're chasing that one. You might have hit the ball perfect this one time, and you're forever chasing that perfection and. It's so addictive. addictive. It's so addictive. I, tell I, you. I think it's good that I don't play because I have a pretty addictive personality. I think I'd get lost in it. Like I you can, you can, yeah. and uh, you can spend a lot of money on it as well. <laughs> it's the same as anything, yeah. you know. Um, but it is very, very addictive, and that that feeling of hitting a really, really good golf shot exactly the way you yeah. want to, which doesn't happen very often <laughs> for anyone, <laughs> you know, um, is uh, is something special. I absolutely, I love the noise though. I love that. Yeah, that's that nice hit or that noise. You don't even know if it's gone sweet, but you just know if it sounded good. But obviously, yeah. you know the difference between a very good shot and a poor shot without even. Yeah, you know. it's I, and that that sound that you're referring to as well. Like as you start watching players who have more speed mm. and more control of how they actually strike the golf ball, that sound is better and better and better. And yeah. even even at the top level, there's a difference in the sound. You know mm. of the of the way in which the top players hit it, and you can just stand there and awe. You know it's um, it's unbelievable. Yeah, you you were talking, and, and this is me being my you telling me prior to this about the Scottish golfer that you worked with. Is he Scottish? Oh, you won the sc- a comp in Scotland. Oh no, that that was um, that was the Open Championship. Open Championship. Yeah, and, and you were working with him. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. What was his name? Jason Day. Jason Day. Yeah, he's a bit of a legend. <laughs> as a person, he is a legend. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, as a golfer, he's an even bigger legend. Wow. You know, he's got uh, uh, world number one, uh, one major championships, won lots of PGA Tour events. Um, How did you come across rubbing shoulders with, or working with someone like this? So the the job I was doing, I worked on uh, the European Tour for, I think it was maybe five seasons, and I was working for one of the big uh, manufacturers. And essentially, I was going to all of the events all over the world. Like, I'd be in Australia one week, and then a couple of weeks later, I'd be over in the US. And li- literally, it was just crazy travel, you know. Uh, but it all become normalized, you know, when yeah. I was doing it. Um, and the bottom line to it is any players that were contracted with this company, uh, it was our responsibility to service their needs then from an equipment standpoint. So, um, you know, when somebody like Jason Day rocks up at the Open Championship, you know, it's our duty really and our job just to make sure that all of his equipment is, um, you know, is, is up to date. There's obviously an agenda from the, the company as well to make sure that some of the, the, the equipment is the most recent equipment so that they can use that and leverage that then from a marketing perspective as well. Mm. Um, but the bottom line to it is kind of like players first, yeah. you know, and just making sure that what they need is what they've got. Yeah. And then if we can tag on kind of like some marketing uh, like spin to it, then you know it was uh, that's what we would do. How does some boy from my stake grow this this empire essentially? How does someone we we spoke about this off air and and not not everyone from our town or wherever you grow up love you know we're not our biggest supporters so sometimes when you do something yeah and it's it's hard it hurts it hurts even me when I hear things about myself or other people who are having a go. And there's always someone trying to yank on your chain, essentially. Mm. But there's such a n- niche market to what you're doing, and someone from where you're from to do it, you know, you're always going to have people say, oh, well, he only did it because of X, Y, and Z, or this, that, and the other, but it's that's not the case with you at all. Um, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm quite a determined, stubborn person, and when I put my mind to doing something, mm. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but a lot of the time I find a way to get it done. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and what a lot of people don't know is this job I had with TaylorMade, which essentially has given me a really good platform to do what I'm doing now. Um, I applied for that two years before I got it and didn't get the job. Wow. So um, You applied for it two years? I applied for it two years before I got the job, and I didn't get it the first year, first time around. Mm. So I, f- I failed on the first attempt, essentially. And... You know, it would have been so easy at that point for me to, because I was actually working in my say golf club at the time when I applied for this job, 
I didn't think I'd get it, to be honest with you. Um, but I got to, like, the last two people out of 290 applicants. And I was thinking, like, what you were just saying here. I'm like, bloody hell. You know, last week I'm fitting, you know, one of the golfers up at my state golf club. And now I'm standing here with some of the world's best golfers, nearly getting a job, traveling the world, you know, and um, rubbing shoulders with literally the greats of golf, you know. Um, and I didn't get the job. So that, I had a choice then. I go back to my steg, and, um, which is a place I love, you know, and I still love going up there now. A lot of my friends are there. Um, and I've got huge respect for that place in general because that also has contributed towards, um, you know, me doing what I'm doing. Or you find a way to get the job that you want. So it was quite interesting doing that interview. It was a three-day interview in Spain. And wow. uh, that interview that I had, I walked up to this guy who was on the range. And um, for any golfers out there, they'll probably know uh, what a track man is, but it's essentially a radar system which tracks golf balls and tracks the golf club, and it gives you literally all of the data that you need from a golf shot. And at the time, I think this was 2000 and I want to say 2011, it was really early for this technology and um, it already just came about and not a lot of people knew about it. And I'd been researching this kind of like almost to the point of where I was obsessed with it. <laughs> so I seen this guy on the range and I thought, right, I'm going to go over and ask him a lot because there wasn't a huge amount of track mans on the range. And I started quizzing this guy and... I wouldn't say that I was Billy Big Bollocks, but um, you know, I thought I knew a few things about it, and I started asking this guy some questions. And he was like, he was giving me these answers. He didn't even understand the words he was saying, you know. Like, <laughs> and I was like, wow, um, like, who who are you? He's like, oh, I'm the inventor of TrackMan. Um, wow. And bottom line to it is, they actually offered me a job on the spot during the interview. And I, I had to kind of like find a way of saying, oh, I really appreciate that. I can't really give you an answer now because I'm in an interview really for the yeah. job I actually want. And when I found out that I didn't get the job that I wanted then, I got in touch with these guys and I just knew that that was a step in the right direction to start building relationships with the right people um, and put myself in a position where I'm constantly seen. So it was really interesting where I went from kind of like failing the original job interview, and I see that as a failure for myself, to actually then taking this other job, and I was actually training then the people who were in the team that I applied to be in with. Wow. <laughs> so um, all of a sudden then, I went from kind of like being down there to being almost, I wouldn't say top of the pile, but I'm actually training them how to use TrackMan and how to interpret the data. And where I went full circle is... One of the guys on the TaylorMade team sent me an email right on a Friday night. And I remember this vividly because um, it was essentially the email that got me the job. He sent me this email asking me a question. And I was living in Cardiff at the time. And I was about to go out. It was like up at 7, 8 o'clock. And I was, I, I was in two minds. Do I actually just send a quick email reply now on my phone? Or do I sit down? and actually write a proper email about this. And there was no kind of like uh, intentions for me to try and impress anyone. It was just, do I actually reply to the email properly or do I give half, half an answer? And me being me, I'm like, right, I'm going to put the phone away and I'm going to get the laptop out and properly. I'm just going to do it properly. And that email, that reply circulated internally um, in TaylorMade and they offered me a job on the back of that email reply. Wow. So like it was, it was quite. I was quite lucky in a way, um, but yeah, that's that's how it all came about. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was, yeah, l lucky and kind of like, um, I I kind of made it happen as well. Mm. You know, um, there was some strategy and intention to it. You know, I think um, you're really good with you're really good with people. Like one of your biggest skills is people and communicating and building relationships and that's why you're so good at what you do now but I think people always think how to get opportunities is, is X, Y and Z but you can just prove right now just showing curiosity in something really mm. like you know just mm. speaking to someone about this this you know this new craze that's just happened yeah opportunities opened up mm. and then another opportunity's opened up yeah and that, like I could have quite easily walked past that guy and I think if I'd walked past that guy and not asked that question I mean that is the that was the 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 start of a chain of yeah. um, events, you know, which led to me getting that job with with TaylorMade. And wow. um, did you move? Did you have to move then? Initially, I did. I moved to Basingstoke, uh, so I moved from Cardiff to Basingstoke. But I was traveling so much yeah. um, 
like I'm not exaggerating, I was doing probably 80 plus flights a year. Mm. Um, I, was ne- I was never there, I moved, but I was never there. And I was always coming back on the weekends when I was off anyway, do you know? Um, so in the end, I actually ended up commuting from Cardiff. Um, so I'd drive to Heathrow mm. for a seven o'clock flight on a Monday morning, We'd fly back in then Wednesday evening. Uh, I'd probably crash somewhere in Basingstoke Thursday night and I'd drive back then uh, Thursday, uh, well, Wednesday night, uh, drive back Thursday night, and um, yeah, just work from home on a Friday. Um, How many years were you doing that for? About, I think, four or five years. S- some commitment to flying. You've done some travel, mate. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy to be honest, mm. and and but it becomes normalised. Yeah, you get used to it. Do you know? And like I, I always talk about this it is like, and it seemed really normal at the time, is that I was in where was I? I was in the US for an event and I flew back from the US uh, and essentially when I got back from, no, I tell you what, it was China, it wasn't the US. I went from China back to the UK. The next day I went on holidays to Cuba. I had 10 days in Cuba, which is brilliant. And then when I flew back from Cuba, I literally, I didn't even have time to pick up my luggage. All the family that we were with picked up the luggage because I just got off the plane and just went straight to the car. Jumped in the car, Manchester Airport, back to Llanelli, which is where I was living at the time, <laughs> uh, repacked another bag and drove straight to Cardiff Airport and flew to Australia. So, like, wow. Y- y- and that was all like normal. You know, I, just I was just like, yeah, that's fine. I'll make that flight. That's no problem. Um, I'll have a sleep on the plane. It's no issue whatsoever, you know. But now thinking of it, I would never do that in a million years. <laughs> it's mad, though. Like, how, like you, it's, it's funny, like you just said, though, you're doing those things. And in the moment, you're just going with it, in it, and then mm. you reflect on you go, how the how did I manage to do yeah. that for so many years? And but it's obviously paid off. Well, it's um, I mean the the experience that I got, not just from a career perspective, but from a life perspective as well. You know, like seeing all of these places. Um, you know, it's just crazy to think that like I've literally probably travelled the world, you know, a couple of times and seen things which I never would have seen outside of doing this job. So. I'm so grateful that I actually got that job. Do you find it? Do you ha- find it hard to say it was a job? It was definitely a job. <laughs> <laughs> After the first year, it was definitely a job because, like the first, the first year is nice because you go into new places all the time. Yeah. But then afterwards, then you go into the same places year in year out. Yeah. And there'd be a couple of new events would pop up, but typically it's the same hotels, it's the same golf courses, you know. Um, and it does get relatively monotonous. Yeah. But um, how do you deal with golfers then? Because I could tell, obviously, the higher they are, the profiles. How do you deal with their personalities? Because you've got from the outside in, you see some of them. Some of them seem like a couple of larrikins, mm. and then you've got the other ones, like you know, the the Tiger Woods, where they're like probably OCD on perfectionists, you know. And how do you deal with these type of people? It's the same as what, like how you would deal with. Most people really, yeah. I mean, you know, you can't just have kind of like one way of dealing with everyone. Um, you've got to adapt kind of like to, to that person, you know. So if you turn up with a player and, you know, they start taking the piss out of you, mm. you start taking the piss back. Yeah, give it know? back to them. Yeah, yeah. Ab- absolutely. But if, if you rock up then with somebody who means business and all they want to do is talk about numbers and talk about performance and talk about, you know, their ball flight and their equipment and what they can do to improve their equipment for that week, yeah. that's what you do, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, but the bottom line to it is you've just got to be in a position where you, they trust you. Yeah. You know, if they don't trust you, 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 you ain't even, you're not even at the party. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and, yeah, I didn't, I didn't find that too difficult, to be honest. Yeah. Good man. But it's, it's good that, I think that's just your personality type is mm. in being, and that's why people are, I think successful people are su- successful because they can be flexible to other mm. people's personalities. Mm. It's not, they're not rigid, you know, they, no, no, no. they bend. So I think, yeah, touching on the personalities and that's obviously how it's accommodated to yourself. And then you start in the business. Yeah. Down the Langlands. Was that where it originally started? No. And where did the name come from? Was it just, that's what you've always wanted or? So... I got made redundant from TaylorMade, uh, and this was the end of 2017, and um, it 
freaking hurt that did. I bet. That really hurt because I was kind of like, I was, I, I felt like I had some unfinished business as well there. Um, like I still had goals that I wanted to achieve kind of like, you know, through that, through that job. Um, and I was actually in quite a bad place, to be honest with you. It really like hit me quite hard. And I've never been one who's kind of like, even appreciated kind of like, or even, I, I couldn't even understand how somebody could be depressed, mm. you know? Um, but I was definitely in that state, you know, after I got made redundant because I'd went, I'd gone from literally on the Wednesday being in the Open Championship, working with, you know, past Open champions and the best players in the world, to Thursday morning, go getting called into a meeting at nine o'clock and five past nine and walking out the door without a job. Wow. Um, she had no was, idea it was coming or? No, I knew there was changes happening because there was big changes within the industry. Um, but... Yeah, I didn't really, I didn't really expect it, and I actually drove straight from there to a wedding because <laughs> I, I knew I was going to the wedding anyway. But I had to go to a wedding then and kind of like tell everyone I, I'm unemployed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the business actually started from that point, um, and I was like, look, I've got, I've got this experience, um, I've got a skill set, and um, you know, I really need to put that to use now, and. The business name, to answer your question, I didn't really think too <laughs> too hard about it. It was just like, what sounds half decent? Um, Torfit Golf. Torfit. Let's go with it. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I, like it. Um, I, I, I think retrospectively, I would probably have thought about it a little bit longer and put a bit more effort into it, but who cares? Well, it, we, are, yeah. we are where we are. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it, I think people don't really think too much. Well, I don't think... I think even... Nike, Nike, when they started, the owner mm. Nike didn't even think twice about the name. Yeah. I think he asked someone else on the behalf yeah. or the design of it, you know, so there we go. Yeah. But obviously, from my end, I've been working with you now for the last three, four months. And just seeing where you are now is unbelievable. Like, one thing you said at the start, which is you had at the start with me, was like, you're, you're, you're a stubborn bastard, <laughs> you've got a lot of drive, <laughs> and you're definitely confident. So it was more just finding that next step and... One thing I realized with you is you, you love, you love people. You love helping people, loving people grow, very similar to myself, and then transferring that now into what you do in business wise is actually you want into where well you are is impacting other coaches and uh, other uh, PGA pros to grow their businesses, and because mm. you've seen the I suppose the highs and the lows of how to start a business, how mm. to run a business, how to actually monitor. A turnover, profit. Obviously, in your industry, so much stock, mm. there's so much clubs. You know, what I mean, you forever chasing tail. This is seasonal yeah, seasons, yeah, yeah. and you've rode probably your first year to where you are now. The highs and the lows of you know, we're smashing it right now. Oh, we're in a hole right now. And well, the, the it's quite interesting because the first year I started the business, which was as soon as I got made redundant, it was literally within kind of like you know a month or two, I guess. Um, initially, I started doing mobile club fitting. Mm. And that was the biggest mistake I've ever made in my whole life. And I spent so much money on it. And I literally got to the point where after that first year, I was like, I, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. I was yeah. like rock bottom. I had no money left whatsoever. I'd spent all of the money um, that I had. For, well, I say all of it. It wasn't a huge amount, but I had a bit of redundancy money from TaylorMade. I'd burned through all of that. I had a mortgage. And I was... Um, I was in a position where I was thinking, do I stay in the industry? Do I come out to the industry? Do I try and do something else? And I'm not exaggerating. I don't know if I've told you this, but I applied to be a postman. Um, I applied uh, for a barista's job in a coffee shop in Mumbles. I applied to be store manager of Costa. Wow. Um, and I didn't get all of those jobs. <laughs> which Thank God you didn't. Well, yeah, but I was kind of like, how the hell can I fail Play in to be a postman, yeah. like <laughs> yeah, it's not much it's crux to it. Well, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it's not as easy as what it sounds, you know. But I was just like, well, what's going on here? And then a job came up then in, in a local golf club, and I was just like, this is going to be probably the safest option for me at the moment. I've done it before, I know I can build um, a business there, and um, you know, I opened up um, a store in a golf club which is in Burryport, and and you know, built it through that. Then COVID hit, which was horrendous. I mean, a lot of people have benefited from a business standpoint through COVID. Um, I mean, my revenue in my second year 
in business in that golf club was a hundred grand less than it was in the first year. Wow! Um, so it just so shows you how much it hit you then. It was he was huge. Yeah. It was huge. Um, Obviously, no one's playing golf, are they? Nobody could play golf, but the 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 hard thing really, right, was because nobody was allowed indoors. All of my coaching, all of my club fitting was all done indoors. So even when people started playing golf, I still couldn't operate properly. Mm. Um, so it, it was it was really really difficult. Um, the second year through COVID, we kind of done a little bit better, but I was still down probably relative to my first year about fifty grand. So I'd kind of guess I was about 150 grand down through those two years in COVID, um, which is quite interesting. Massively, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people would have jumped, wouldn't they? A lot of people would have... Well, you, you just got to find a way, haven't you, you know? And, um, and I think sometimes the more you struggle, the kind of the bigger the opportunity it presents itself to come out the other side. Um, and luckily, we're, with, we're through that now. And, you know, the help you've given me over the last three months has been... You know, invaluable really because, nice. yes, from a business standpoint, you know, we've been doing really well and, you know, you've had a really good influence on kind of like, um, you know, not necessarily what we're doing, but how we're doing it, you yeah. know, in terms of presenting myself with prices and everything else. Um, but just kind of like holistically, when I look at kind of like uh, the time I've got now with the family, um, you know, health wise, I'm definitely healthier now than I was three months ago. Um, you know, it's been it's been brilliant. It's been really really good, and business wise, we're doing well. Well, you've just branched off now to two places, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're gonna get a coffee shop, is that? Right? <laughs> well, yeah. So, like, I'm like a dog with a bone, right? Like, as soon as I <laughs> as soon as I get an idea in my head, I'm gonna do it. And if I fail, I fail. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, we're kind of helping out my state golf club a little bit. Um, Go the, back to the roots. Yeah, and and it's been. I don't. I don't want to say this really, but like from a business standpoint, it's really not like a huge opportunity. But emotionally, um, like I really, really want to do it. Um, so we've done that. I'm. I'm not sure, kind of, um, how successful that side of it is going to be. Um, but I really want to do it, so I'm going to do it. That's <laughs> good, man. And then the coffee side of things. Then uh, we just read. We're going to redesign kind of like the shop uh, in Langland. And we're going to have an espresso bar in the shop. Mm -hmm. And I love my coffee. I'm a proper coffee nerd. <laughs> so, like, um, you know, I really, I'm really excited about it. Yeah. You, um, well, you talk about being coffee snobs. And then I, I realized when I started speaking to you, there's another level to the I degree could, of... I could bore anyone to death <laughs> on coffee, I'm telling you. Costa screwed up, mate. Costa realized <laughs> they missed out on a good one. <laughs> uh, it's actually embarrassing to think that I thought that was a good option. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> hey, what, a, what an amazing thing that I uh, thank God that didn't happen. Mm. And you know, just seeing the way you are now uh, and just seeing how much you grow. For, like, I think we spoke about on the other day, how you've, I think it was something like from th this time last year, it was like a 35% increase in margin or pr revenue. Is that around that ballpark? Yeah, we're uh, like year to date, we're 30, just under 36% up. Amazing. Um, which, yeah, I, I mean, the, the whole industry like as a whole, is, is down this year compared to last year. Um, but I think through strategy, through some um, some risk, mm -hmm. through a lot of hard work, um, you know, we, 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 we're we doing all right. Mm -hmm. We're doing all right. But um, What do you notice, for instance, now now that you're, you're pivoted now into essentially mentoring businesses in your industry, what are the common issues you are seeing with a lot of people in your line of work that are, you know, stopping them, I suppose. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because, like, I've, I've done a lot of presenting and I've done a lot of um, working with PGA professionals before, uh, before I started this role, really. Um, and I, I want to get back into that. And I, I always get people asking me, oh, I'd love to pick your brains, I'd love to do this. So, you know, I really want to create kind of like um, another revenue stream, really. Um, I don't want to do it as an alternative to what I'm doing now because I really love it uh, and I want to make it a success and I want to, I want the golf club I'm working at now to be really proud that I'm actually providing that service for them. Mm. Um, but, you know, golf pros and PGA professionals, essentially they, they struggle with time. Mm. They work a lot of hours. Um, the margins can be really, really tight. Um, and I mean really tight. Um, and 
yeah, profit as well is, um, you know, is, is hard to come by. Yeah. So, you know, it, I, I think I can have a really big impact on, on PGA professionals, you know, helping them with time, helping them make more money through club fitting um, and optimizing their business and looking at cash flow strategies and looking at forecasting and helping them yeah. kind of manage pre-books, manage stock levels. And the, the interesting thing, in, and I've been guilty of this myself, is kind of like we get into business and... I've not got a business qualification. Mm. You know, when I first got into it, and I was like, oh, yeah, this sounds good. I've got a business. What's cash flow? Do you know, mm. what's forecasting? Um, you know, what, how much stock should I have? Is that good? Is it bad? What's my stock turn? How often should I be turning that over? You know, and that's something I'm quite passionate about. And You're very ana- analytic, aren't you? Like, very much like stats, figures, graphs. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's not. it's not very often now that I don't know how much stock I've got. Mm. Um, what categories are struggling, um, where I need to put offers on, where we are from um, you know, profit and loss perspective, um, where we are looking at kind of like year-to-date revenue numbers. I mean, the spreadsheets I've got, I mean, for a lot of people who are into spreadsheets, they probably won't look like much, <laughs> um, but I'm pretty impressed with them, do you yeah. know? Um, I and, am, and I, and I, 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 I enjoy, you know, analyzing it. Mm. Yeah, man, it, for me, it's, you know, I, I love the thing with, love working with clients because you learn so much as I learn so mm. much as well. Like I learn off you what's helped you grow, what's not. And then even like speaking on behalf now of creating time for you, right? Your team are thriving in a different way. Like yeah. you've upskilled your team so much that it's given you this freedom again. Mm. I want to ask, this is a bit off the question, but I want to ask you regarding golf fitting. Now it's, you're within millimeters right now, aren't you? Within mill of getting it right or wrong, is that right? Um, yeah, small margins. Small so margins. Like, yeah, you're talking about, um, you know, if we're making adjustments with golf clubs, when we are building, as an example, I'm building a club within a sixteenth of an inch. Um, you know, we're measuring the degrees on the club. You know, if if anything, like I always think, if it's not perfect, it's not right. Um, which in some regards is not a good thing because it takes me a lot longer to build clubs. I was um, going to say, you, if you were doing your <laughs> apprenticeship, mate, they'd, if you were going through clubs as your apprentice, <laughs> just carving into clubs. Yeah. Like, but, but, but this is the thing, right? Is like, I, I know you're not referring to the apprenticeship I'd done. No. But my apprenticeship that I'd done, God, well, I didn't even do it. I kind of done, you know, three quarters of it. Doing an engineer and apprenticeship has served me so well doing what I'm doing now. And I think this is, is part of the reason why I've become okay at it, yeah. you know, because you're working with, when you're building or machining parts for aeroplanes, the tolerances are like ridiculous, mm. you know, like really, really tight. And the margins they're working with in the golf industry in general are not tight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> true. You know, um, so f- for me then, I'm just like, well, you know, if it needs to be, f- the driver needs to be 45 inches, it's going to be 45 inches. Bang on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nothing else. Or nothing yeah, more. It's, it's, small, it's small margins. What would, a, what would a set of clubs, I know this is a hard one because there's so many price points, but what is, I bet when you started playing golf to what they are now, mm. but the price of a set of c- clubs is... Yeah, so the, perce- the, the perception of a price, uh, the set of clubs is like golf is really expensive. It's the same as anything. Mm. You know, like if you want to get into running, you know, like you buy a Garmin watch, a pair of Nike trainers, you know, some, you know, some kit, you know, you can burn through six, seven, eight hundred quid mm. kind of, well, even probably more than that. I mean, some of the watches are 700 quid now, aren't they? This Garmin was, uh, yeah, there was 700 quid this yeah, Garmin was. Yeah. yeah. Um, but also you could do it to go down to Sports Direct and, and get a pair of trainers for 15 quid and start, you know, yeah, and it's yeah. the same in golf is, you know, for a couple of hundred quid, you can get a starter set. You can go to a golf course and you can pay 10 quid to go and play a round of golf. Um, but at the same time as well, like I get clients who who come in and, you know, they spend three and a half grand on a set of clubs um, and they want a duplicate set for their house in Spain, wow, you know. Yeah. Um, so that there's there's a lot of money that you can spend on golf clubs and, and three and a half grand for a set is, for a good set, is, is about average. You can go up quite a lot more than that. Mm. Um, but yeah, it can be expensive. Yeah, what what are your th- your top three experiences, best experiences? What this business has given you? Um, the business now. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, if if we're talking about kind of um, clients, um, 
we've had a lot of success where we've kind of like fitted someone for a set of clubs. Like we had a we had a guy this year. Um, you know, we fitted him for a new driver, a new three wood, a new set of irons. Um, pretty much 11, 10 or 11 clubs out of 14, you know, and he goes and wins one of the big tournaments in Wales, an amateur competition. But that's a really kind of like good feeling mm. where, you know, you're not responsible for it, but you've contributed Contrib towards it. Um, but I think kind of like from an experience perspective, the thing that I'm probably proud of the most is that it's all come from struggle. Mm. You know, like it's, it, it, it started like from from struggle. I mean, I even remember the first job I had up in my Steg golf club um, when I was head pro. So it's the same job as what I'm doing now, just up in my Steg. And this was kind of like 12 years ago. I remember wanting the job and needing the job. I got the job and then I was like, right, I need to stock the shop because zero money. Like, what do I do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Zero money, like literally. And, uh, you know, I need to put however many thousand pounds worth Shit. of stock in the shop. So um, I thought, right, okay, I can do some junior coaching, yeah? So went home, printed off a load of posters, got the database from my say, golf club of all the juniors, hand-delivered all of these uh, flyers to all of the juniors in my steg because I couldn't afford to buy stamps. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, and... You know, we got 200 quid in for a day's worth of coaching or whatever. I went out and bought some stock, um, sold all of that, then bought some more, sold all of that, and then bought some more and just kind of, like, built it up from there, really, you know? So it was literally, you know, both situations where, you know, I've been up in my steg, um, built, started to build a business there. That started from nothing. Class. And the business I've got now, mm. you know, even going back to 2018, I was, like, rock bottom. <laughs> it was hard. Yeah, that, uh, we didn't touch on it too much, but obviously that that's hitting a rut like that man is quite hard to get out of. Mm. Um, well, the, the 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 rut that I was in when I contacted you was a little bit from a business standpoint, yeah. but it was a lot of it came from like personal situations. Um, I don't know whether you want me to go into this or not, sure, but sure. Um, but but like in in twenty twenty two, I was training for Ironman Wales. And I was going good, and you know I had this ambition of kind of like going sub eleven forty five in Ironman Wales, and I was like I was on for it, you know I was That's swimming, going. I was swimming well, I was biking well, I was running well. Um, I'd done a marathon in the end of twenty twenty one, I think, and I can't remember what it was. It was like I done a three twenty something marathon. I was like for good me it was pr pretty yeah. good, so I was like flying, and then I started having a few issues, kind of like with my nuts, right? And I thought it was from from doing a lot of biking. Sitting on the but at the same time, I didn't want to kind of like leave, leave anything kind of like develop, you know, if there was any issues there. So I went to, went to the doctors, as you do, kind of like, um, you know, they kind of like, uh, you know, give you a uh, examination. That all went okay. Um, at the same time, my other half uh, was going through miscarriage. Um, and that year, she actually had two miscarriages. Um, so she had a lot going on and I felt really responsible to kind of like to help her. But through my own journey of going to, you know, get my nuts sorted out, the bottom line to it and cut a very long story short, um, ended up going private, um, had loads of scans which were all working okay. And the last ultrasound scan I had, they actually found a lump on my kidney. Wow. So I had to go home and I felt so guilty to tell my other half that they found a lump on my kidney when she was going through all of this as well. And like my mind was just all over the shop and I went from kind of like thinking about Ironman Wales 11.45 to kind of like bloody hell, I might not be here kind of like at the end of the year because your mind just does all, it plays all yeah, sorts yeah. of tricks on you, doesn't it? Um, and yeah, through that really my perspective kind of like changed on training. I like a safe kind of like place for me is to work. Um, and I just started working harder and harder and harder and harder. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it all ended up kind of okay. So the um, lump, what was the lump essentially in the end then? So essentially the, con the consultant said to me when I went in, um, after he'd done the ultrasound, he said, right, I think there's two options here. Um, you've got, I think it was an, uh, an adenoma. I'm probably going to like butcher the name of it. Um, but some sort of like, um, 
lump which uh, sits like on your adrenal glands which will need uh, an operation to remove it because it can have a really big effect on your hormones yeah. and the other option was kidney cancer um and and it, it was like holy shit <laughs> like, no your perspective fully changing yeah and it was it was quite like stressful so that that i think was kind of like towards the middle of 2022 and i went for a ct scan then um and the consultant phoned me and he said right okay i've got the results um can you come back for a consultation and this was like uh i think in november and he said i've got a slot for you on the 24th of december i'm like you can Exactly. <laughs> I don't care where I've got to go. I don't care how many planes I've got to get on. I want to see someone and I want to get these results before the 24th of crazy. December. Um, so I managed to get in and I was sitting in the waiting room. Um, and because it was like urology, you sit in there with, um, you know, older gentlemen who are going in to probably get like the results of kind of, you know, any scans they've had on prostate and everything. I'm sitting there and I'm just like, you know, guys are walking out in floods of tears and I'm just thinking, oh my God, here, here we go. And I've walked in and um, he started talking to me and I'm like, Let's forget this. I, I, I don't want to know like how you are and I don't want you to know how I am. Just get to the point. Get the small talk. Yeah, <laughs> let's get straight to it. And he's like, oh, it's all fine. Um, the, the lump is not um, cancer and it's not an adenoma. <sighs> it was, um, uh, what did he say? I can't even remember what he said, but as soon as soon as soon as he said it wasn't those two <laughs> things, yeah, ex exactly. <laughs> but like through that process, I actually felt like I prepared myself to for me to have like kidney cancer, yeah. and I almost felt like I I'd been not been through it because I clearly haven't, but psychologically for sure. And you know, I'd be sitting there with my daughter, just thinking she's not going to remember me. Yeah, do you know? Um, and it might sound really dramatic, no, it's but true you though, but isn't you, it? you you can't kind of like you can't help to get away from that you know when somebody says you might have cancer yeah. worst case like scenario what, um, what's gonna happen so that kind of started like a big rut for me really where i kind of like i sacked off all of the training um and yeah just started working and working and working and working and um yeah i just got myself into a situation where i put on a lot of a lot of weight you know um working way too much um you know not seeing my family doing all right business-wise, you know, but also not having a huge amount of energy in the business. And this is wh why I reached out to you, you know, because I was in that rut. I kind of knew what to do, but I just needed somebody to point me in the right direction mm. and shove me, like, down that road quite hard, you know. Yeah, perfect, man. <laughs> well, thank God, man, that those results weren't worst yeah. case. But, man, it, it's funny, right, what you just said then, just sparked something to me, as in people need these wake up calls to mm. really implement what they should be doing you know like maybe if you didn't have that experience mm. maybe would have just still been i don't know going down another path but we have like these moments of our body or something mm. goes mm. hey come on tom yeah let's sort this shit out let's get, yeah. get the wheels turning let's not just put our head straight into work and ignore the rest of life you know and thank god man for these things and but like credit to you like the way you live your life now is you got balance. Yeah. Oh, no, Training. I'm ma ma massively balanced. And, and kind of, that is something that I'm really, really not good at either. <laughs> like, I'm the world's worst at balance. I'm like all or nothing. I'm training for an Ironman or I'm sitting on the couch, <laughs> you know, eating pizza. Like, there's no in between. Do you know what I mean? Um, and uh, it's it's been quite good working with you, to be fair, because, like, you just kind of learn, well, actually, you know, to be healthy, I don't have to do kind of like, you know, a six-month diet, year, you know, and um, I don't have to do anything extreme. I've just got to make, like, a series of really good, solid decisions and have some sort of structure to your day and, you know, add in kind of, like, a run on a Thursday, which I've been absolutely loving. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say the run I've been loving. The um, coffee after, though. The coffee after and the chat afterwards, yeah, you know. It's, it's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's good. And, you know, Thursday morning after I get home, kind of, like, I've definitely got the most energy out of the whole week starting work. Mm. Um and, you know, it's a 30-minute run and it's a coffee and it's yeah. a chat afterwards. It's great. It's, really, it's, it's really, been really, really good. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. It's a uh, credit to you, obviously. But, yeah, the, the run, the running on Thursday is amazing and it's just all walks of life, different people there as in, like, you know, different professions, different paths. And you wouldn't even talk to these people if you didn't do these no. things because you'd just be another person walking down the street or something. Yeah, exactly. Know. Before you know it, like, you know, you, you there's... You're mixing with people, there's social events, there's, uh, you know, 
potential golf events is going to be happening. And yeah. then on top of that, I was started doing it in, on Mondays in Swansea, yeah. running running on Swansea with yeah. your crew and other golfers. With, yeah. But that's what it's all about. And like yeah. now you're now like you talk about the, getting the coffee coffee shop in there. Two birds, one stone. Love nice a coffee. Class. Yeah. Getting a bit of a run in with everyone. Yeah. It's Saturday day, right? Yeah, it's exactly. It's a key component. Exactly. And, and, and there's something like really like liberating, I think, about talking to, talking to somebody and getting to know somebody you don't know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know? Um, and, and in my industry, it's very easy to be introverted and I can really kind of like go into that kind of spot um, often because you're dealing with people day in, day out and... Not everybody gives you energy. Some people like take it away, you know. <laughs> um, you know, it, and it doesn't mean they're bad people. Um, but uh, you know, actually rocking up on a Thursday morning and just having a chat to someone you don't really know—it's really casual, you know. It's like it's like when we we were in um, ahead of the game just now, you know. And I'm chatting to Felipe, and he's. Yeah. You know, I would never have kind of like had a chat to him now, you know, if I hadn't been to the run club, you know, he's a great guy. Isn't he's a great you know? guy. He's a funny fella. <laughs> he said, like, funny you talk about people who are not giving you energy sometimes. There was this, uh, we had training last night and one of the boys was whinging and, and one of the boys goes, what did he say? He said something like, come on, mate, don't be stealing from my bucket now. Don't be taking out of my bucket. So true. <laughs> so I was pissing myself what he said because it was so, so true because yeah. this guy was just whinging over nothing. Yeah. And then he goes, come on, mate. They'll be taken out of my bucket now. Yeah, it's like, fuck, that's true. Yeah, if you if you, I think if you can have more people in your day, you are filling your bucket rather than emptying it. You, yeah. you'll have a good day. Mm. <laughs> it's so true though, isn't yeah. it? It's so true. Uh, and the, like you just said, then though, about you know having people in your day who bring your level energy up. It really doesn't take much though. It's not like you actually you've got to be, you know, some happy go lucky guy. You just got to be curious, genuine. Mm. Say hello to people. Yeah. How are you doing? What, what mm. do you do? What are you up to? Where, where are you going this weekend? You know, just ask general questions and people mm. love to talk. Yeah. I, I find I find it amazing, kind of like even walk down the street, you say, hello, good morning, good afternoon. Like, people look you stupid. I know. Do you know? Don't it's smile at someone down the street. <laughs> They're like, fucking hell. Rob me. Like, so weird though, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know? Like, what? why? 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 <laughs> <laughs> it. I don't get it. I literally, like, uh, me and my mate, we'd run and we'd, everyone we'd run past, we'd play a game. Like, who can we say hello to or good yeah. morning and <laughs> we do it to so many people and then you get a couple who would just straight blank you yeah you'd be like fucking dickhead <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> just play the game it's such a yeah simple game man but tom it's been an absolute pleasure having you on um obviously the podcast alone it's been amazing but just getting to know you as a person um it's an absolute pleasure you you're a breath of fresh air to work with but actually now to call you a friend to go run club on Thursdays with you to see how you just connect with people, how 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 much of a family man you are. Like you, you talk so highly about your daughter and your partner. That for me is like the creme de la creme because yeah. that's the key component of life is connection and family and love. And I'm very grateful to have you, yeah, to to meet you, man. And then what you're doing now with work wise is even better. Yeah. So thank you so much. I always ask my guests, so Tom, as you know, is just what are you grateful for? I'm grateful for. My kids, they're literally the best thing that ever happened to me, like both of them. Um, they li- they like talking about filling your bucket, yeah, like yeah. they fill my bucket. Um, <laughs> and I need to have a big bucket sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my other half, Ember, as well, I mean, she's a legend. She's probably the most selfless person that I've ever met, you know, and um, I'm just really grateful to have her in my life. Um, and, yeah, that that's, that's life for me, just right there, you yeah. know. Love that, man. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Don't just talk it, walk it. Walk is only. Don't just talk it, walk it.